Globalizing yourself and your career. And I chose the title that way because as much as anything else, in my view, globalization is a state of mind. I'm going to start off by talking a bit about myself because essentially that's why Jesse sort of created the talk. And what I want to do is to see what I can pluck out of my experiences. I'm now 68. I've had a full working career that I retired from nine years ago to share with you, given that you shortly will be starting out on careers that will take you well into the middle of the 21st century. And one of the things I speculate about later on is what will the world be like in 2060? As well as myself, I think there are some lessons from my four children for you as well. So this is me, uh, a long chronology. I, th I felt it would be helpful to set it out so that you've got at least some sort of picture of it before I get into individual details and it saves an enormous amount of repetition. My parents were incredibly poor. They were illiterate. They spoke fairly poor quality English. And I grew up in the slums of Cholton on Medlock, which is an area of central Manchester that no longer exists, really, because it's all underneath the university. And then Moss Side, which may be famous even now in Bath, but certainly was notorious in the 1960s. And I went from Moss Side to Clare College, Cambridge. And I get very annoyed when people say to me that places like Oxford and Cambridge don't welcome applications from disadvantaged people because I was incredibly disadvantaged and I never felt the slightest concern about discrimination against me in the process of applying. My question, challenges were always, would I be good enough in terms of the exams, etc. And the interviews were wonderful experiences. I drifted into teaching because I didn't know what to do and then I discovered accountancy and as soon as I qualified as an accountant I became a tax specialist which is what I did for the rest of my career with various roles at PricewaterhouseCoopers. I was the second ethnic minority and first Muslim to become a partner in Pricewaterhouse in the UK. And one of the things I've done in retirement is teach myself HTML and construct my own website where there are over 600 pages, including some very specific tips on personal success, which range from the very big picture to the really micro, such as how to use your telephone. So being global, in my view, is a state of mind. Two journeys. I came to the UK in 1952 by ship. I was aged one and three quarters. I didn't leave the UK until 1981 and the reason is very simple. We were extremely poor. When I was at grammar school, having passed the 11 plus, the school had regular foreign excursions. I never even thought about asking my parents if I could go on one because I knew we couldn't afford it. And similarly, when I was at university, uh, having spent three months away at Cambridge, you know that your parents want to see you. So I spent all my university vacations at home in Manchester with my parents. But in 1981, when I was a newly promoted manager at Arthur Anderson, the firm's policy was to send all managers, all new managers worldwide to new manager training school in St. Charles, Illinois, which is a former uh, Roman Catholic college that the firm had bought and used as its worldwide training center. And it had a policy of shared bedrooms and they used to make interesting choices about how they paired people off. So I don't believe it was a random coincidence that my roommate for the three days I was there was a white Africana from South Africa whose hobby was pistol shooting. They want to see if you can get on with people. And then you had everybody who went on this new manager school, there were five of us from Manchester office, had a, booked a few days holiday. I had decided unilaterally I was going to go to Washington DC no matter what anybody else did. And lo and behold, they all decided to come to Washington DC as well. 
it shows the benefit of being clear yourself what you're going to do. People just follow you. And what was interesting about Washington was that I was the tour guide. None of us had ever set foot in Washington before. I think all but one of us had never been to the USA before, but yours truly was showing his colleagues around Washington DC and telling the history of the buildings. And why? Because I had absorbed so much of the USA as I was growing up. Everybody chooses what they eat. Everybody chooses what they read. Everybody chooses what they watch on television. Everybody chooses what films they go to. And you become the result of your choices. It's a point I make regularly when I speak to school children. I spoke to three schools in Birkenhead, all Roman Catholic schools, on Friday of last week. And I used to read Time and Newsweek and at university I came across the New York Review of Books which is the most intelligent journal I have ever come across and I still subscribe to it now. There have been gaps when I didn't subscribe because I got so far behind with reading it but I would recommend that to anybody. It's incredibly broadening of your mind. And on TV I followed the US politics from the age of 10. When I was 10 I told my mother to get me up two hours early at six rather than eight so that he'd get the result of the 1960 presidential election as early as possible. When I was 14, I stayed up all night for not just the UK general election, but the American presidential election. Slattery's people, if you search on the Internet Movie Database, you'll find more about it, but it was a, a television series about some state legislators, I think in New York State, but again, you, you can absorb so much of another country's culture without ever setting foot in it, if you choose to do so. So, a bit more about my career. I was a tax specialist. Big accounting firms like PwC, they basically have three arms. They do tax, they do auditing, and they do management consulting. And they are in that order of being country specific. So tax is by far the most country specific. Auditing is pretty global, but every country has some company laws of its own which are distinctive, and management consulting really is incredibly global. And as a tax advisor, you only advise on UK tax, because it's hard enough to know one country's tax system. But you need to understand other countries' tax systems if your clients are engaged with them. And nobody can sensibly advise the UK subsidiaries of a US multinational without understanding US tax. You don't give advice on US tax, but you really have to understand it, which is why Arthur Anderson, when I became a new manager, sent me on a, a one-week course on US taxation. And the same applies when you're investing overseas. I needed to understand enough about taxation in India, for example, to be able to tell if the Indian firm was talking sense or talking nonsense when advising my client in the UK about the tax affairs of its Indian subsidiary. And you do get involved in some very big international transactions where you're trying to coordinate PwC offices all around the world because your client is either buying or selling something very big with lots of different companies involved, each of which has tax issues and you have to understand the local country issues and also how this interacts with UK tax law. One point about technology, because everybody says, you know, with video conferencing, why is there so much international travel? What about your carbon footprint? You can't get to know somebody at a distance. You can deal with somebody over the phone a lot, but you really do need to meet in person, which is why sensible heads of tax of multinationals make a, spend a lot of their time traveling around the world, meeting their overseas advisors. You need to know what a person's like over dinner, what about their family, and these one-to-one -one relationships are incredibly important. My largest US client I served throughout my 22 years at PwC, and until he retired, because he was six years older than me, for virtually the whole of that time, the key person in the relationship at the other end was the worldwide head of taxes, who was a, a, a Jewish chap. He was the first Jewish vice president at this multinational 
and I got to know him and his family extremely well. And you can work remotely far more effectively if you actually know the person on the other end of the phone line. A little bit about my children. My eldest has a PhD in classics, and his PhD itself was on unarmed combat in the ancient world, but he's a writer. These days, the electronic communication, international communication is free. I grew up when make phone in the USA was an incredibly expensive thing to do. And he was literally working from home, from his bedroom in our house, for a computer games company in California that he never met until several years into being their employee. He actually went over to world headquarters in Sacramento for the first time. And as the company grew, he found himself supervising about 12 people in places like the USA, Canada, China, Greece. His sleeping hours were hopeless because his team was scattered in so many different time zones and he was always on the phone to them or on Skype calls to them. But none of these were people he met except those rare occasions when somebody else might end up at this meeting at World Headquarters. So a sign of what the, the modern world is like. Number two son, completely different. He worked for a software company in Stockport near Manchester. But in a multiplayer game, he met a woman and then they got married. He moved to Detroit. They've since split up, no children, but he's going to settle in Detroit. So very different kind of globalization. He's just gone somewhere else. Eldest daughter, my, my daughters are the big travelers. The boys never really sort of went anywhere. Uh, and she spent many years doing field work on pottery in Uganda, digging it up and classifying it. Got disillusioned, and, but she likes traveling. She's now a consultant with Accenture. She's been there for a couple of years. And the modern consulting lifestyle, she literally can be told on a sort of Wednesday, or maybe, I don't think we've done it on a Friday, but say on a Wednesday, next week you're in South Korea. Very different aspect of globalization again. And the last one, daughter who did Japanese, she simply spent a couple of years living in Japan teaching English because more and more people these days do choose to go and live overseas for extended periods. So what do I think about the future? Yogi Berra was a famous American baseball player and this quote is undoubtedly extremely wise, but it never stops people and it won't stop me from having a go. I'm a shareholder in Berkshire Hathaway, the large American, you can't really call it an investment company, it's really an insurance company with lots of other bits stuck on, but it does all kinds of things. It's a massive conglomerate. And Warren Buffett, who is its CEO, and its largest single shareholder is now worth 83 billion. In fact, there's a website you can go to which tells you his net worth every day, obviously just based upon plugging in his shareholding in Berkshire Hathaway and multiplying by the share price. And when I was reading the latest chairman's letter, and my holding, by the way, is tiny, absolutely microscopic, worth about 100,000. His chairman's letter was reminiscing about 77 years ago when he bought his first ever investment at the age of 11. And as he says, he went all in. He spent his entire investment fund, $114, which by the way shows you he had a rich family because $114 in 1942 was a meaningful amount of money, especially for an 11 year old kid to have, and bought some shares. And he then says, what happens if we go back 77 years, and then another 77 years, where do we get to? And you get to 1788, when the USA was two years old, it was two years after the Declaration of Independence, four million people, and if you just look at the amount of change in that time scale, or the amount of change in Warren Buffett's 77 years from 1942 till now, it's thought provoking. And just looking at the UK in terms of real incomes, if you go back to, to May 1950, it, real incomes were about sort of seven and a half thousand a year compared to 25,000 a year. And these are inflation adjusted numbers. But the inflation adjustment doesn't really capture it in my view, because even over a 10 year period, never mind you know, 60 years, 
over a sort of 10 year period how the price of televisions changed. The price of the TV just didn't just go down from two grand to 1300. The 1300 TV is incomparably better than the two grand TV. And when I was a teenager, I used to dream about having a, some kind of electronic connection to this massive library of knowledge. And of course, it was a complete fantasy. The technology didn't exist, there was no library, etc. But every one of you carries one of those around in your pocket. For decades, people <coughs> tried to get computers to play chess, and they were hopeless. Then all of a sudden, they were very good. And the best chess players in the world since for 20 years have been computers. Go, which is a Japanese board game that I also play, uh, was much harder to, for, to computerize, but 20 years after Deep Blue, a Go program running on some quite good hardware managed to beat the world's top human Go player. The DNA was discovered in the 1950s as a link with Clare College and we spent billions decoding the human genome, which we can now do for $1,000, and we can edit the genome. So the pace of change isn't stopping. In terms of what I expect, self-driving cars are <coughs> coming, and I don't think I will ever buy another car, because when my present car packs up, why should you own a car if you can just summon a, a, a driverless car on, your, on, on an app? and use it for the couple of hours that you want it, whereas most of the time my car is sitting in a garage doing nothing. Same as when I need a carer. I would actually trust a robot carer more than I would trust another human being, because robots are less likely to try to steal your money or abuse you. And in terms of your lives, once, especially after a robot start making other robots, you face an enormous material cornucopia but on the other hand, you also face a fundamental philosophical question. Why would anybody ever want to hire you for anything when robots can do everything better than you can? And that's a serious point. I mean, everybody talks about how people do more educated things. The pace of progress of computers, technology and robots, eventually there will be next to nothing that computers can't do better, and you might need a handful of sort of genius programmers for very peculiar things, but beyond that, for what? And some of the people genuinely did see it coming. I'm a big reader of science fiction. This, if you haven't come across this book from 1957, this is actually a detective story, but I'm just interested in the world that this detective story was set in, a world called Solaria, with 20 million people and 200 million robots, where robots basically did everything, and the humans simply lived like pampered Romans in Roman villas doing nothing because they don't need to do anything. Although the challenge comes, how do you give your life meaning? So that's a quick run through my career, some of my thoughts about global, global careers. And the best part of sessions like this is always the question and answer session. So ask away. <laughs>